Hello and welcome to Horror Movie Talk, an opinionated and accidentally funny horror movie review show. Your panel of expert hosts each week are Dr. Bryce Hansen, who holds a PhD in spookology, and Professor David Day, the foremost expert in scare no-nos. New theatrical releases always get priority, but we also review older horror movies, both good and horrible. I'm Bryce Hansen. And I'm David Day. No fake ad because I forgot to write one and I don't want to take time to do one right now because we're recording two episodes. Brendan, uh, Brendan also is not in attendance today and, uh, and he was not able to read, so it doesn't even matter. Mm, right. So before we get started, please go to horrormovietalk.com and check us out there. You can find links to our social media and links to all the podcast platforms that you'd care to subscribe to us on. And please do that if you're not a subscriber. Subscribe and leave a rating, especially if you're an iTunes or Apple podcast is what they call it now, what the kids call it now. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a rating. We got a goal to get to 200 ratings by year two. And uh, we're going to need some help with that. I'm going to be honest with you. We need a lot of help. Yeah, because we're trying to qualify for Rotten Tomatoes program to be a verified reviewer or whatever they call it for podcasts. And we need 200 ratings. Everything else we got going for us in terms of qualifying by the second year. But no problem. We need more ratings. So please do that. We've got a great show for you today. Yeah, I'm really man. excited about seeing this one. Um, didn't really plan it too much. And this one, I don't know when we're going to release this one. This is one that's going to kind of go in the can for a while as to be held in reserve. We're going to be talking about Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. Wow, what a th- well, this just came out of left field at me. I didn't even know about this one until you were like, I watched Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer on Shudder. I was like, what's that? And then looking at it, it was made in 1985. I was like, 86, I think. Yeah, I think it was finished in 85 and like started hitting the uh, film okay. Okay. places in, I don't know, 86. It had a long history of not being released. It didn't get officially released until like 90 because it was so controversial. Yeah, so this is a movie that was first introduced on the kind of list of serial killer movies. I had never heard of it. It basically said like, this thing is legit. Yeah, it. It's super legit. I'm going to be totally honest. I had never heard of this movie. I didn't know what it was, and it sounded so dark and twisted just upon reading about it. I mean, there's lots of movies that are made about serial killers, and especially since this one, there's been a lot of movies that are kind of like it that try to do the same thing, that just not as well. The weird sense. But this was kind of like the first one that took a real, like, stark look of the realities of yes. what a serial killer is. The reality and the sincerity is what's most strange and horrifying about this. Yeah, so we'll be, we'll be talking more about that in just a second. We just want to give kind of an intro to the format for the show for our new listeners. We'll start out by giving a brief review and our score for the movie. We score on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being a miserable dredge where it makes you angry that you even watched it, 5 being completely average that hit all the expected marks but didn't excite you at all, and 10 being so good it transcends genre boundaries. After we give our score, we'll get into spoilers and take a deeper dive into what we liked and hated about the film. And then later on, we play some games and do some bits sometimes. If you're a new listener, you weren't treated to one of our great advertisers on the show today, but usually we have a you know pretty great ad leading into the show, so check out other episodes. But today we're going to be doing a game we like to call Lifetime, Lifetime Movie or Horror Movie. Yeah, baby. Oh, baby, bringing the good games back. None of this horror porno stuff. Yeah. So we watched Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, and it's harrowing. It is intense. Yeah, it sure is. Here is the trailer for Henry. Otis, plug it in. Did you really kill your mama? What? Did you really kill your mama? I guess I did. She must have treated you real bad. 
Shirahor. So Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer can be found streaming on Shudder.com if you have a subscription to Shudder. If you don't, well, do I have good news for you? If you use code HMT at checkout, you get a 30-day free trial. So, yeah, like I said, I had not really heard about this movie, but I've, I had seen it in lists and was like, every time it was mentioned, it was like, this is intense. It feels too real. You'll be sorry you watched it. But uh, it's it's good. It's a great movie. Yeah, I don't. I always dread movies that have those labels on them, right? Because my worst fear is having something in my mind that I really regret, right? Uh, because I don't like that. But I I can't say that I feel that way about this film. Yeah, I mean, if you like serial killers and like true crime stuff, this is the type of movie that you kind of wish was made about them. Yes, because. It's just so plain and puts you in their world so thoroughly that you feel like, ugh, this is the most amount of dread and disturbingness, if that's a word, that you can feel about serial killers. It doesn't even do that to me. And to be <clears throat> honest with you, what this movie did to me was it did what I always expected about at least some serial killers, which is... They really are human. Like, right. You know, it's, it's, they are human. You can share some empathy with them and feel bad for what they went through. Right. To but get then them to that spot. Yeah, but then there's a very, very large and important part of them that's extremely frightening. Yes. It's, it's definitely extremely frightening. It's weird that I made a fairly emotional connection to understanding. Yeah. All these characters were so, such real people. Right. They were such, people that you walk by on the street right deeply flawed too yeah Mm -hmm. so henry is played by michael rooker which you'll probably recognize from guardians of the galaxy guardians the galaxy or the walking dead he was merle in the first couple seasons which he was great and i mean anything i've seen him in he is great he's a great character actor and this is the first film that he was featured in and then like he was mostly in tv and voice stuff Mm. after that but, I mean, it was – I could definitely see if this was your first film that you'd kind of get typecast or put into a box around that because it was – if you watched it, it would stick with you. He's got a real distinctive voice, so yeah. I can see why he did voice acting. So, anyways, Henry is a serial killer that's constantly on the move but is momentarily staying with his former cellmate, Otis, played by Thomas Towles. Also living with them is Otis's out-of-state sister, Becky, played by Tracy Arnold. She flies in to escape her abusive boyfriend and to try to find work to bring her daughter down to live with her. The drama in the film is the interaction between these three characters. The trio is a powder keg of trauma, sociopathy, and victimhood. However, as the title of the film suggests, the main purpose of the plot is to paint a stark and unflinching portrait of Henry as a serial killer. It's really surrounding just laying it out and just giving you a real good understanding of what this guy is about, what his life is like. Never have I felt 
that a title was more appropriate after viewing it. Before viewing it, I was like, what the fuck is this bullshit? I know. I think the Lifetime movie or horror movie is an apt game for this one because it feels like a Lifetime title. It sure does. Like, portrait of a serial killer. Anything with portrait in it sounds like, all right, that sounds like a little too flowery. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a little too artsy fartsy. And this is not artsy fartsy. No, it's not. But it is a very accurate title. Right. This is one of those films that feels a little too real. Even though it's definitely a narrative-driven Hollywood film, it shows the realities of killing in such plain detail that it almost feels like a documentary. Yeah. Like, it really has that documentary feel, even though it's not handheld. It's stuff is shot static. I looked in the trivia, and, and originally they wanted to shoot it handheld. And There's they parts a, of it. And made a decision to not do that. There are parts of it where you're viewing their actions through video camera. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm glad that they did it the way they did. But anyways, that, that's all to say that it is very much a movie, but it feels like a documentary. When I, when I told David about this movie, I described it as, it's like Taxi Driver, <laughs> but without the touchy-feely parts. <laughs> and, I, and to which I balked. I said, oh, excuse me? <laughs> the touchy-feely parts so is that, Taxi Driver. Is that an accurate description? Yeah, now upon, now upon viewing it, you know, there are some touchy-feely parts. Like I said, I did yeah. uh, develop some empathy and some emotional r- response to this movie it's so. I guess I'd say maybe I'd change it to. It's like Taxi Driver, except without the happy ending. Right. There's <laughs> there's no love story. There's uh, well, there is a love story. Yeah, kind of. Yeah. I mean, one sided maybe, or two sided. That's what's so interesting about this whole thing is you kind of get a window into what it might be like to be very close to a serial killer. Yeah. Well, we can talk about that more when we break it down. Anyways, you're thrust into into a world of people that are deeply broken and are dangerous to each other and themselves. It feels at times like a snuff film, mainly because within it, there's a snuff film. Uh, Henry reminds me of a couple of my favorite movies yeah. like of all time in terms of subject matter and tone. First is David Fincher's Seven. Yeah, that's fair. It's very, I mean, just the subject matter of a serial killer and just the tone of just dark and feeling gritty and like the crime scenes are a little too real. But I mean, obviously, Seven is more over the top, more stylized and is more along the lines of a traditional serial killer Hollywood movie where it's like he's an insane person. He's got an unbelievable serial killer. Yeah. And then uh, the other one, even more so, it reminds me of Darren Aronofsky's Requiem for a Dream, which is I'd one of the films that I have stated previously is my favorite film yeah. of all time. Can't it's like Wrap your head around that. That's Bryce's favorite <laughs> film. Because I can't point to a film that affected me. I find it so impressive that a movie could make me feel so miserable. <laughs> like that the experience was... That movie made me more miserable going out of it than any movie has ever made me feel good going out of it. And therefore, it must occupy the favorite spot in my all of my films. No, I, mean, I, I, it's I understand. Super effect- and it's great. It's like a fantastic film. Anyways. You know, I would like to touch on this movie reminded me. It feels like it inspired a lot of movies to me. Namely, Natural Born Killers. Man, it feels like Natural Born Killers was almost taken from this and put on meth and then released into the world. Um, Yeah, even though, like, Natural Born Killers is also super stylized, though. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Like, they just took it, Hollywoodified it, amped it up, you know, turned everything to to 11 and went nuts on it. And then the other one that this reminded me of was Manhunter. Right, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring up Manhunter. Oh, okay. In, in the notes. Um, okay. So yeah, we'll we'll talk about that in a second. So it's a film that sticks with you and makes you feel dirty just watching it. This is unlike most narrative driven Hollywood movies. This is because unlike most narrative driven Hollywood movies, this one has no glamour or spin surrounding the serial killer. So I mean, there's a little bit of just even in the media. Yeah. When you're talking about serial killers, there's kind of this. Romance. Like romantic view of what that means yeah. or even just the romantic view of the danger. And that's not in this film. It's just so plain. It's, it's just so like matter of fact. Very stark. Yeah. It's undeniably a great film. 
just from the fact that I don't think I've seen anything like it and it deeply affected me. Like even since, like I can point to movies that came after it that are a lot like it. Yeah. But even then, it's yeah. not treated with the same tone or seriousness. It's very strange. It's very unique. It's very different. It's very, it feels all of these, it feels very influential. It feels like, it feels like one of those movies that you're like, wow, how has no one ever made this before or made the commitment to tell this story before? And why haven't I heard about this? Right. It's all of that. It's a tremendously interesting movie to me in every way. Yeah. So my score is the highest score, 10 out of 10. I'm going to definitely say this is just a fantastic movie. It transcends genre boundaries just because it's like enters into this is an important film to watch just to see the type of story and the way it's told is just very unique. And the tone is something that you haven't seen before. It accomplishes something weird, which is it feels art house, but also it defies everything right. that you would expect an art house movie to be, which is clever or brilliant or right. aspirational. It's so guttery. Yeah, and there's no like ulterior motive or underlying message. The underlying message is just like dread or nihilism. That's that's it. I mean, I guess it depends on, you know, how you come at it because uh, the underlying message that I very strongly got from it is people are made, you know. Right. They are a blank canvas that you place shit on, and depending on the amount of shit that gets placed and the flavor and variety of it, you're going to get this person or that. Well, even then, I mean, they're all equally just like, treated to abuse and, and trauma, but Becky didn't become a killer, you know? Right. No, I mean, yeah, it's, there's definitely roads that you can go down and roads that people do go down depending on their sex and depending on their predisposition towards violence or uh, love or whatever it is. My inclination is I, I don't want to give it a 10 out of 10. I think that's my inclination on every 10 out of 10 movie. It feels like an upper echelon thing. It feels like something that should be reserved for the most special. But, you know, after talking about this a little bit, I think this is something very special. And it was done perfect. Yeah. There's no nothing yeah, that should no be cut. Real, no real compromises. Mm -mm. That's the thing. The other film that we've reviewed that's similar in terms of treatment of the killings is The House That Jack Built. Yeah. Like, it's very dry and feels very clinical. matter of fact and clinical. But obviously, The House That Jack Built was very stylized and has a lot of, like, cutesy yeah. stuff that's added on top of it. I love that movie. You kind of hated that movie at the time. Yeah, but, you but know, have, have grown I, on it. But yeah. like that's uh, the other film that is kind of a good comparison of like what are the different ways you can treat the same kind of story. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So before we get into spoilers and talk more about some of the finer points of the film, we want to tell you about our Patreon page. If you go to patreon.com slash horror movie talk, you'll find our Patreon or there's a link at the top of the website on HorrorMovieTalk.com. Right now we've got one tier that gives you access to all of our added content in perpetuity. But that may not actually be true because this is a canned episode. So. That's true. Let's just say go to our Patreon page and support the show. You'll get access to exclusive content there. At After Pods, we have a, a separate podcast that you can listen to, which is mostly gossip, therapy, and crying mm -hmm. and laughter. And masturbation. Lots of that. Yeah. Um, you can support the podcast also by buying pretty much anything on Amazon. If you click through the link on our banner at HorrorMovieTalk.com, it's a green button. It says buy stuff on Amazon. And then finally, if you want to watch this movie or other great horror movies like it streaming online, go to Shudder.com. And for our listeners, we have a special offer. If you use HMT at checkout, then you get a 30-day free trial to Shudder as opposed to that fucking awful, just shit. God damn it. Gallon of shit, seven day free trial. It's such garbage. I don't I don't know why anybody would do anything other than enter HMT at checkout. Right. It's so stupid. Ugh. Also, if you want to write for us, contact us and you can write for our blog. If you're interested in any horror movie topics, you can write for our blog. And if you have trouble coming up with a topic, we can give one to you from a list. It's fun. Just uh from a <laughs> 
from a perspective. Con- convincing. I know. Like in terms of, from my perspective, doing the podcast, it's very nice to have a creative outlet. And, you know, the other aspect of it is if you have an endeavor that you're looking to plug a website or even a business or something like that, we will be happy to work with you if you, um, you know, produce content for our website. Mm-hmm. We are happy to have you. And then also, David has another podcast that you can check out called the Positivacast. Yeah, it's a daily podcast, short form. Not a big commitment. You only got to listen to it for three to five minutes a day. And it's just me trying to give you a little boost, a little bit of caffeine in your drink there to help you be happy and have a good day. So thanks again for listening. Let's get into spoilers. Spoilers? Yeah, spoilers. That's that's what we're doing right now. Okay, so this film opens strong. So it's flashes of hyper-realistic crime scenes with brutally murdered corpses. And it really communicates one thing. Buckle up. Yeah, it sure does. Um, (laughs) I introed this to my wife saying, are you ready for this? And she's like, what? I'm tired. What's happening? And I was like, we're going to watch Henry portrait of a serial killer. And she's like, that sounds dumb. I was like, it does sound dumb. Doesn't it? She's like, yeah. I was like, I'm told this movie fucks. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, Oh no. Like she, she was like, you're not going to subject me to some fucking like, uh, are we really going to watch another snuff film, David? And I'm like, I don't know. Let's see what happens. And then the first part of this movie confirmed all her worst fears, and she promptly went to sleep on the couch. Right. (laughs) And then this morning, she gets up. She's like, how is your snuff film? I was like, it was actually kind of a work of art. And she's like, that's what you say about all of them. And I was like, well, they all are. (laughs) It doesn't even necessarily show him murdering people. It just shows the after effects of it. So you're just like, you know, very... Which is almost worse. Yeah. Because it's a long, hard, 30-second panning shot over the devastation that he's left behind. Yeah, which is not how you would normally do it in a movie. Normally, you would, like, show the danger by showing him, like, stalking and actually killing someone. But this is so much more disturbing just to see dead bodies splayed out. And... And not just dead bodies splayed out, mutilated bodies. Right. Like, there's one hooker on a toilet with a nice set of cans. Yeah. With a a broken bottle shoved in her face. Bottle, like, lodged up through, either up through her bottom jaw into her face or down from her nose. It was... Not fun to look at. Yeah, I mean, it literally looks like... It's not like a glamorized shot of a dead body of like, oh, look how tragic. It just looks like... Someone who struggled for their life. Just a bag of flesh left over. Yeah. It's just like, ugh. It it's, feels dirty very early on. There's no veneer on this film. And so this is where I was going to bring up Manhunter. Compare this to another serial killer movie made the same year. Yeah. Manhunter was made in the same year, and if you're it's not familiar- telling basically the same story. Manhunter is trying to tell you, like, this is what serial killers are really like. Right. Except it's super stylized. It's like Michael Mann directed that one. It's a great movie. Manhunter if, is a great movie. If but you're not familiar with Manhunter, it is it essentially is Silence of the Lambs before they remade it into Silence of the Lambs. Right. So Manhunter is based off the same book that Silence of the Lambs was based off of. There you go. It tells essentially the same story. And yeah, Hannibal Lecter is even in it. Yeah. It, no, Buffalo Bill. It's about, I, I believe it's well, just Hannibal. Well, a- Le- the character Hannibal Lecter oh. is in Manhunter. Okay. Okay. I, I just don't remember that, I suppose. Yeah. It was played by... Um, the guy from Blade Runner? No. Hannibal Lecter in Manhunter is played by... I think Harvey Keitel. Is that right? I don't know. I don't know. Anyways, it's a great movie, but it is also like the kind of how you would expect a serial killer movie to be like highly stylized, like kind of romanticizing yeah. and like fetishizing. Kind of the, Miami the Vice thrown yeah. in there. And this one is just like, no, this is just a guy that kills. Yeah. Like he just kills people. Yeah. Whereas Manhunter is like. A very Miami stylized, like kind of sexy thing. Where it focuses. This is like Cleveland. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
and like most serial killer movies and most stuff that you hear in the news about serial killers, you associate it with like, oh, this guy has an M.O. Like he is, you can tell it's the Zodiac killer because he left a Zodiac sign or something like that. Or it'll focus on like the calling cards or the serial killer toying with the police and it's like a chase. And yeah. You, you wonder if like, is he going to get caught? Is he going to solve he not the gonna- puzzle? And in this one, in Henry, it's so interesting because he's like, none of that is in it. He's like, in fact, he addresses it. He's like, nah, man, they're looking for a puzzle to solve. If you just do shit at random, if you're just randomly violent and horrible, there's no way for them to trace it back to you. You can't be caught. But you got to keep on the move, and you can't be predictable. Yeah. And it's like, oh, <laughs> whoa. Yeah. He just says, oh, yeah. I mean, if you're going to kill people, just kill them a different way every time. So, D- like, some people you got to stab. Some people you can use a gun sometimes. Sometimes you strangle them or break their neck. And then you just you just got to constantly move. Just move on. Don't even use the same gun because then that's your thing. You know, you yeah. use the same gun every time. Don't have a thing. There's no thing. Just, yeah. There's just you being horrifically violent and leaving no trace. Right. And just that sequence is super disturbing because you realize like, oh, he's got it. There's there's people doing this. Yeah. Like that's how there are serial killers out there that will never get caught. Yeah. Like the ser- if you think about it, the serial killers that we know about <laughs> right. that have calling cards They're the bad ones. and they keep doing it and you know how they all get caught? Right. Well, that's why. That's like, why. They're the dumb ones. They're predictable. And it's not even like that they're particular that it would take a, an insane amount of intelligence to understand. Just don't toy with the police. Yeah. Just don't send evidence to them. Right. And then you won't get caught. Yeah. And it's it's really disturbing it's, to think about. It's a lack of ego. It's right. it's it's like discard your ego and just be violent. Right. And it's like, whoa, that's the intent? And of course that's the intent. They're a serial killer. That's right. But they're a good one. Yeah. So this feels really like it's the first movie of its type. And it's probably the greatest of its kind just because of its commitment. It's unflinching. Like there's other kind of straight to video movies that it reminds me of. Like there's a I think there was one on Ted Bundy. There's one on um what's his name? Who's the guy that like ate the people's brains? Or that injected the acid into their brains to try to keep them. Oh, yeah. A Dahmer. Dahmer. Like, yeah. there's a Dahmer movie that feels very similar to this, but is still, like, not quite the same thing. Okay. You know? Yeah, I, I haven't seen that. there's lots of influences. I think that that had um, Jeremy Renner as Jeffrey Dahmer. Dahmer Jeremy like, Renner? Yeah. Wow. Anyways, there's lots of films kind of like that where it's trying to tell, like, a very stripped down story of a serial killer telling like this is what it's really like but none of them really tell this story where right. it gives the full picture of the group of people around them their history the way they react to things and just the um, kind of their base their base level impulses instincts and their what makes them do this yeah especially that's the other thing is that it doesn't have any cops in it to hold your hand through that that's right. probably another feature of other serial killer movies is that they sit there and they explain the motive and they explain their history. And you say, like, this type of person probably has problems with his mother. There's probably, a- you know, had trauma and stuff. And, like, you're not given the exposition or the character development through a third party. You're just shown it right. with how they interact and how nonchalant they are about the facts of their life. Right. There's a bad guy, good guy element in other movies that this one doesn't have. In this movie, the protagonist and antagonist is Henry. The only guy you get is Henry. And I mean, there are parts of this movie where you're definitely rooting for him. And it's it's strange. If you, when are you rooting for Henry? When he's protecting. Um, oh, well, yeah. And and when he's when he's telling his story where you're like, oh, yeah. no, like, that's so sad. Like, what happened to you is what made you. Yeah. So this movie is actually based on loosely based on a real life serial killer named Henry Lee Lucas and shares a lot of similarities. Uh, he's acquainted with a fellow convict named Otis. He was a lover of Otis's niece. That's a, his sister in this film. I mean, it's actually more disturbing in real life because the girl that Henry has a relationship is an 11-year-old. Okay. And somehow in IMDb it says Lucas became the lover of Tool's 11-year-old niece. That's just such a dirty way of saying it. 
They were lovers. Yeah. No, dude. He was raping the little girl. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of similarities. Even his history, the like the fictional Henry, the real Henry's mother worked as a prostitute from her house, often forcing him to watch her while he had sex, while she had sex and occasionally making him wear a dress. And the real Henry's father had also lost both legs in an accident prior to which he had been a truck driver. So lots of, I mean, it's basically based off of that real life serial killer. The differences come when the actual murders, because it sounds like Henry Lee Lucas just admitted to all these killings to get like a lighter sentence, getting other stuff. Let me read this. Lucas confessed to over 600 murders, claiming he committed roughly one murder a week from 1975 to 1983. Ultimately, however, the vast majority of these claims turned out to be false, while many of the rest could not be substantiated. Now, that's a pretty common thing in in serial killers' stories, is they literally lose track. They have no idea. This is the case with the Green River Killer. This Mm -hmm. is the case with a lot of them, where they're just like, you know, I don't really think of people as people. Like, they're literally things for me to get off on. Yeah. And so... I don't, I don't know how many, like six, how many weeks are there between 1980, between 1978 and 1983? 600? Okay. Yeah. Then I probably did about 600. Yeah. They said that he was probably confessing to every unsolved murder brought before him because doing so ensured better conditions for him and they gave him kind of incentives to confess. So, I Mm. mean, a lot of this had to do with police just wanting to close cases. In the end, Lucas was convicted 11 murders and sentenced to death for the murder of Frida Powell, that 11-year-old he was fucking. Although his death sentence was later commuted to life in prison by then-governor of Texas, George W. Bush. W. So, uh, thanks a lot, W. Yeah. So, it's based in real life, and it feels very real. Michael Rooker, again, is absolutely great in this. The other character, Otis, is a drug dealer and sexual predator. Like, pretty much everyone in this film is pretty bad there's really only three people in this film yeah. right you know there's so michael otis. otis and becky becky is otis's sister and she is introduced in the beginning of the film to henry and she finds out pretty quickly from otis that he was in jail for killing his mother god which is this is making like when we break this down it's making me feel gross yeah like, this is so gross so pretty quickly otis leaves becky and henry alone and they're playing cards together and this is kind of the establishing scene of the relationship between Becky and, and Henry. Becky asks him directly about killing his mother. Yeah. You know, as one does. And she's very, very open and she elicits him to be open. And they kind of bond over their shared trauma. Yeah. Cause Becky basically describes how her entire life was sexual abuse yeah. and physical abuse. It's just normal to her. Yeah. And she had just escaped from an abusive boyfriend. You know, she was afraid that he was going to kill her. But it was still, you know, pretty normal to her. Yeah. Because this is just life. Yeah. And then... You know how life is. You know, and Henry was describing the reasons for why he just killed his mother and described all the things I just talked about, the real life Henry Lee Lucas experienced. His mother was a prostitute, made him watch her have sex with her Johns, And then sometimes wear dresses, just like just a level of cruelty that you just don't even understand. Like I can almost understand being a serial killer, but I don't understand doing that. Right. It's and that's and that's how you get to be the serial killer is almost always, almost always. It's mom fucked up a boy by just being intolerably cruel and sexual against him. As Henry's telling the story of how he kills his mom, it keeps changing. Yeah. Yeah which I don't really know what the purpose of that was other than I was guessing that he's trying to obfuscate or it might be that he just I don't, doesn't remember or I don't doesn't even, want to tell yeah. the truth. I don't think it's obfuscation or lying. I think it's just like the thing that I described before where it's all such a gigantic grab bag of horrific trauma and terror that you don't even know what's real anymore. You've just been turned into this kind of animal that has the ability to talk and needs to kill. But what's really conveyed is Becky has a real casual attitude about getting abused and sexually assaulted. And Henry is deeply broken and disturbed. Like while he's telling the story, you can tell like he's like very twitchy and he's worried about opening up this much about and he's still like pretty guarded about it while he's doing it. So 
Otis, when he comes back, he reveals that Becky is a stripper. I think this is another scene, like another day. He reveals that Becky's a stripper. And there's kind of a subtle moment where, like, you can tell that Henry definitely judges prostitutes and just people selling their body. And he attaches that to his mother and they're, they are to be punished. So even just that subtly understanding that he's like, wait a minute, you were a stripper? Like, all of a sudden. And she's like. No, you you realize as the viewer, like, uh oh, she's in danger. Yeah, like, that's like there's so many moments of dread that's just signified of like, uh oh, something's turning in Henry's head. Right? Did now. I turn him on? Did I yeah. activate him somehow? You know, Otis is such a casually deplorable piece of shit. Yeah, that um, he's a pervert. He has no qualms about assaulting boys or girls he's not super intelligent he's not super intelligent he just and he's just an asshole too he's just an asshole but also all of these characters have kind of a good side you know they have a casual side that's Mm -hmm. that's tame it's not like natural born killers where everybody is charged with this anger or this intense like emotion it's like Hey, we're calm right now. I'm just I'm just strumming on the guitar, you know. Right. So so they feel like real people. These aren't characters in a the movie. They feel like real people who you've met before and you've gone, I wonder what that person's like with their family. Are they horrible to their family? Yeah. I mean, the major thing is Otis is really inappropriate with Becky, his sister. Like kind of well, it doesn't culminate, but it really shows itself at, at, in this scene because when Becky comes to like set down the dinner or something, give Otis, him like, some beer. Otis grabs her by the neck and like tries to kiss her. Kiss her like not like you know brother and sister kiss like you know <laughs> yeah that that other way <laughs> you know that, like that. sexual abusing kiss. And uh, Henry puts a stop to that real quick, lightning fast. Yeah, it's um, like he jumps up and grabs and says, "No, she's your sister." Yeah, and so there's like this weird thing where you realize that Henry has some rules. Yeah. Internal rules about what's good and bad. And somehow that crosses the line. Yeah. Killing hundreds of people, that's not that bad. But you don't also, you don't kiss your sister. You also get the impression that Henry likes yeah. Otis's yeah, he, sister. Yeah. Which is endearing. You know, it's like, oh, he's gonna protect her. Yeah, so Henry stops him, but it's interesting because you see that Henry understands good Otis's impulses. Right. And that bad stuff is going to happen with Otis anyways. And so Henry's like, all right, let's go out and get beer. Or Becky tells him to go out and get some beer while she cleans up. And so they go out and Henry kind of recognizes what's going on. He's like, hey, let's go get some hookers. Because <laughs> he realized that Otis needs some release. And then kind of casually or <laughs> accidentally. You're having such a hard time with this. Henry kills the hooker that he's having sex with and then just turns around. And kills the other one that Otis is having sex with because yeah. she starts screaming. And They're having out. sex in the car. One pair is in the front seat. One is in the back seat. And I have a feeling that any time Henry is getting it on, it goes south. <laughs> I think that going south is the culmination of Henry's sexual desire. And Otis is shocked by this. So is Otis's hooker, who is like, oh, no, you're hurting her. You're hurting. And Henry's like, well, we can't have you yelling, so let's just snap your neck. And Otis is like, shit, I was about to – and now she's – oh, my God, what did you do? You killed her. And Henry's like, yeah, we'll get used to it. <laughs> yeah, just- and it's it's the introduction to Otis because Otis is not that far off from being like a killer. Right. You know, he is that damaged. Yeah. And uh, it's basically Henry for some of this film is just kind of leading Otis through like, this is what you do. Here's how you do it. And Otis is like, what are we going to do with the bodies? And, and Henry's like, like, just nothing. Just dump them. Put them on the street and we drive away. Yeah. Just it'll, don't. It'll be fine. Yeah, and then he explains like, "Here are the things I do to not get caught." And then he he also explains dispassionately. It's basically just kill or be killed, right? Like you understand, Otis does understand because that's like the mindset of these people is that I'm doing things because if I don't, they get me. You know? Yeah. It's us versus them. It's very primal. Like, primal. Yeah. That kind of extends into another scene when Otis gets angry, kicks in a TV. They go to buy a a used TV, and they kill another person together. And that's like a pretty intense scene. That's kind of another scene out of other movies where it's a guy 
that doesn't realize who he's dealing with and pushing his luck by like yeah. insulting Henry. Yeah. And then Henry just snaps and kills him. And then so they get this camera and, and all of a sudden Henry and Otis are bonded and they're, you know, they're like, this is our hobby now is killing people together. Yeah. We got to get our fix. And they, yeah. So now they start their spree with a um, film Dio camera. Yeah. <laughs> a little video camera. Yeah. VHS camcorder. And then with that camcorder, it's integral to probably the most disturbing scene of the movie. This is the scene that it really does show like beginning to end in full detail. It shows Otis and Henry assaulting this family. Like this husband is tied up on the couch and Henry's holding him down. Otis Otis is fondling his wife. Has the wife tied up and he's like literally just like ripping open her shirt and like fondling her and going to rape her. It literally looks, and this is shot, this is like you see it through the viewfinder of the camcorder. It literally looks exactly like what an actual rape and murder would look like. It's very, it's very upsetting. You know, as we're describing this film, I'm becoming so disgusted with like the optics on how this makes me look. <laughs> you know, like I just gave a 10 out of 10 to this really just tremendously horrific movie. Right. Um, but what you're missing, if you're thinking those bad things about me, is the context of how incredibly strange and unique and well done this movie is. See, that's the thing. It's not exploitative that's somehow it pulls it off to where it's very very intense and disturbing matter of fact but yet but as a matter of fact it's like literally you know this goes on right this is violence that happens and i feel like i know that this is a strange aside to be having right now but i also feel like it's important to mention because I know how this sounds. If you're listening to this and you're horrified with the casualness of the conversation that we're having, first of all, it is horrific and it's treated in this movie as reality. It's so strange. Right. And that's what makes it unique and influential is everybody got that out of this. Yeah. So, yeah, that that family scene is like the realest scene of the film and like oh, it's so intense that they're like raping the mother and holding down the father. And then all of a sudden, like the teenage son comes in the door yeah. and is like, oh, fuck. And then like they chase after him and then they kill him, kill everyone. And it's all there, like just laid out in front of you. Yeah. Really disturbing. I mean, it's going to stick with you. And that's like definitely if you're worried about something sticking with you or or being triggered about past trauma or something like maybe steer clear of this one because it definitely will affect you on the other side of that you know um rob zombie films i don't like at all <clears throat> right see that's the other the it, it the comparison feels... is like the glamorization and the over-the-top killing and right stuff, that's th- gross that that's also gross but it, but it, you're desensitized to it because you know this is just a movie yeah this one you still know it's a movie but it feels so real and you don't have the comfort of knowing, like, well, this isn't actually real. Because you realize by watching it, it's like, this is so real because this really does go on. Right. Like, and this exact thing and it's, happens. And it's strange and unique. Also, I feel like the fact that it was made in 1985 is some somewhat important. Because I did not expect to have this level of reality thrown at me from a movie made in the mid-80s. Because it's past, like, the cinema verite period in, like, the 70s. Right. It's, like, right in the middle of, like, coked up Hollywood. Yes. And, like, like, the excess of the early 90s and stuff. It's just this stark portrait of a serial killer. (laughs) It's, like, literally just, like, you know, while you're doing your coke and watching Gremlins 2, here's a movie about what really happens with people just violently killing people all the time. Yeah. I'm glad we said that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of amused that you're worried that people are – you think people are going to be like, wow, David is a huge creep. He really likes watching well, the violence. Well, of course you're amused by that. You're amused by everything that I do. <laughs> yeah, you think that I'm just – I feel like I'm somewhat of a stereotype or a portrait to you a little bit of like, oh, look at – I know how he's going to react now. You know, It's like I'm always concerned that someone will mistake my intention. Mm. And with this, it feels so gross because it is. And there is a level of care 
that I believe is necessary to impart upon people that, you know, maybe this isn't something they listen to all the time. And this is an off, just the first episode right. they've hit us on. And it's like, Jesus Christ, what the fuck did I get into? And also, if that's the way you feel, yeah, that's the way I felt too. Watching this movie is like, first of all, I felt dread leading up to it. And then I felt strangely like this was a very possible reality while I was watching it. And therefore, it doesn't have the same level of disgusting used kind of grossness that comes with an exploitation film like something that Rob Zombie mm -hmm. would make. This comes with a sense of honesty. Yeah, that's the other thing as I think about it. It's kind of has some irony in it that super hardcore metal and you definitely send stuff across to me. I mean, one of your favorite bands is called Infant <laughs> Annihilator. And I'm sure like the lyric and there's even like songs that you sent me where it's literally just like serial killers talking about. Yeah. You know, them killing people. But that's like a different thing. It has no, like, yeah. It's, that's like an aesthetic thing, <laughs> right. like extremity for the sake of extreme. Yes. And this is not extreme. It's very plain. Right. And so, you know, when you're like showing me or like stuff where it's like extreme, you know, even if you like, you're not one prone to do this, but you know, like extreme internet videos and like. Oh yeah, like I hate that. Torture stuff and. And whatnot, like you can send that and be amused or like fascinated by the extremeness of it, right? But once it like gets to a certain point where you're like, "Are they okay?" That's that's too real. Like you're enjoying this, yeah. Like, this is definitely one of those films that, like, if you sat down and were delighted watching this movie, mm -hmm. and we're like, "Wow, that was awesome!" Did you see how he raped that girl and slit her throat? That was fucking awesome. I would be like, what is – I don't, I don't want to be your friend now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's funny that you bring up the extreme metal and all the imagery and stuff that comes with that. The irony of, of all that is not lost on me. And, you know, it's funny. Our mutual friend Justin was talking with me two days ago. He casually said, as we were in the elevator together, he said, you know, I think you're the only metalhead I've ever met who's not constantly like, duh, nah, 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 nah. like, you know, I think that what prompted him to say this was I was whistling some whimsical uh -huh. little thing. And that was not metal at all. <laughs> and it was mm -hmm. just a fun little whistle song. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, you don't ever like sing or like you do nothing of the stereotypical metalhead stuff. Why is that? And I was like, it's an aesthetic and it's not one that I. It's an aesthetic, not an identity. Right. It's not something that I portray. I've never identified as I am metal. These people who dress up this way to like with all the band patches and tattoos and spikes and shit. That's fine. If that's your thing. I love that scene. I think it's cool. It's not me, though. And I don't get off on any of the weird imagery or stuff like that. It comes part and parcel with the thing that I like. So I know that's weird to say, but there you go. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the kind of third act of the film. Becky comes on to Henry very strong. They get back from kind of a date, and she really starts um, taking off her shirt. It's such a weird moment because yeah. you're like, oh, my gosh. It's like a little bird climbing into a lion's mouth. Yeah. You know, it's like the little bird wants to make a little bed inside a lion's mouth. It's like, don't you understand? You Please, no. Don't, Becky. You don't. But before they can really get into it, Otis completely cock blocks him. Yeah. And Henry is super disturbed about this because he's got like, I think sex in his mind is only associated with violence yeah. at this point. And he has some kind of care or protective quality around Becky. Yeah, he cares for her. See, I don't know. We can talk about that in the end. I'm not sure that he actually cares for her. In so far as he can care. In so far as he can care, he, he cares, about, cares her. about her. Yeah, whatever that but looks also, like, I don't know. But he's also like a psychopath, so he can't actually love anyone maybe like he, he can he can't feel attachment see and now we're boiling down the exact thing that's so fascinating about serial killers is no one can ever know yeah you know they can tell you a million times but you'll still never know what that looks like in your head and you'll still never really be able to relate to it because you're not a psychopathic serial killer right. so when he says i guess i lo love you too now like he says it like that at some point towards yeah. the end of the movie, she's... Yeah, but you don't understand if he's saying that to appease her or if he, like, doesn't really understand how he feels or it's surprising to him. Is this love? Like, you have... 
that's the most interesting part is we can never know what his internal feelings are or what he's going through. And that's what's interesting. Right. So Otis stops him and then Henry is like disturbed and he needs to go. He like gets himself out of the situation. He goes to get him some smokes, but really he goes on the hunt. He ends up not killing anyone. And when he returns, Otis is just raping Becky. Like he's just on top of her, like no holds barred. Yeah. It's a good 30 seconds of maybe minute of rape. Yeah. And this uh, ends with Henry killing Otis violently and then dismembering him, (laughs) dismembering him. And then Otis, sorry. And then Becky and Henry leave together. Yeah. They dispose of Otis's body and then they're gone. And then you're wondering what's going to happen to Becky. Yeah. And there's several moments of like, it could happen. Did she actually leave with them? Yeah. Or did they leave together or, or whatever? And you're never really, it doesn't tip its hand about what Henry is actually thinking ever. And it ends with him like telling Becky, like, all right, we need to get some sleep. And then the next morning he wakes up and gets in his car and drive off alone. And you're like, oh, he took off without her. He took off without her. And then the last shot of the film is him stopping by the side of the road and just dumping Becky's suitcase that has some blood on it. So he definitely killed Becky and well, left her. So it's you like, you know, I mean, but the other option is maybe, maybe he just realized he had Becky's suitcase in the trunk, and by virtue of his profession, killing hundreds of people, there happened to be blood on the trunk, right? Because right. he had residual blood from Otis or some other person, and Becky is still in the bed. Yeah, no, maybe, that's not what happened. Maybe she's okay. So it's the most stark and nihilistic <laughs> ending is like, oh, like there is no hope. There is no, I mean, Becky is like the ultimate horrific kind of pixie girl that appears in the protagonist's life and yeah. changes him for the better. And, yeah. And uh, she's like that version for this movie. Yeah. There's not a better chance at Henry establishing a relationship with someone that cares about him, he just can't kill her because it's him or her in his mind. Yeah, that's crazy. So it's uh, really intense. You need to see it. It's a really great film at showing how unfeeling the killers are towards their victims. There's no empathy. None. In yeah. Henry or Otis. It's just you're a toy Yeah, to, it, to them. And it feels so real because they don't make Henry like crazy. Like there's definitely things broken inside of him. There's definitely like neuroses and ticks and stuff, but they don't focus on that. They just focus on he's a predator. Right. He's going out on the hunt and not even like stylized. You can just tell he's going to kill someone. Yeah. Final recommendations. Who would like this? This is a pretty specific lane. Yeah. I, I mean, if you're super into true crime and like stark depictions of actual murder and serial killers, like if you're really like to get into the weeds about what does this actually mean? Yeah. This is the movie for you. Yes, for sure. So people who are obsessed with serial killers, of which a lot of people are. And then uh, also, you know, if this is a movie you've never heard of and you're a serious horror movie buff and you're just super serious about seeing, like, for example, historical horror movies, you know, important parts of horror through the ages, this is an important movie in horror because – It influenced a lot of different films, and there's not much like it in the 35 years since it's been released or so. So, Check it um, out on Shudder. If you got Shudder or if you want to check out Shudder, use HMT at checkout and watch Henry, Portrait of a Serial Killer. Let's move on to Lifetime or Horror Movies. Lifetime or horror movie time. Okay. <laughs> so lifetime or lifetime movie or horror movie is a game where I read a synopsis or description of a film. Mm. And David has to tell me whether this was a film made by the Lifetime Network or a horror movie. A flim? Some of these are surprisingly hard. Okay. All right. Well, We'll see about that, okay? Because this, I'm pretty good. This is a supersized edition. I got ten questions. Whoa, mother! Jeez. Okay, double 
the pleasure. So I got to get fun. I got to get six to win. Mm-hmm. Six to win. All right. Okay. Number one. All right. A husband and wife who recently lost their baby adopt a nine-year-old girl who is not nearly as innocent as she claims to be. I feel like I've seen this movie recently. Um, I'm almost sure it's a horror movie. I don't know if I can recall the name, but I feel like it's about an orphanage or something like that. And so I'm going horror movie. Horror! It is a horror movie. Oh, Bazinga. You're right. It's Orphan. Oh, 2009. Yeah. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Turns out to not be a nine-year-old girl. Spoiler. Oh, shit. Uh, number two. Uh, I mean, some of these are hard. So. <laughs> uh-huh. Carrie White, a shy, friendless teenage girl who is sheltered by her domineering religious mother, unleashes her telekinetic powers after being humiliated by her classmates at her senior prom. <laughs> Are you joking? Lifetime movie or horror movie? <laughs> Are you joking? Um, yeah. So at first, the first words were Carrie White, and I was like, okay, whenever you intone a full name of a female in the description of a movie, that's almost a sure sign that it's a Lifetime movie. But upon further analysis of this description, that is, this movie is definitely Carrie, the Stephen King Adaptation, and it is a horror movie. Horror! You are correct. That's a horror movie. (laughs) Carrie, 1976. How did you know that? How did I know that? Number three, a a (laughs) 40-something ex-policeman named Joe initiates an online relationship with 20-something Tanya Sullivan. Conflicts arise after Tanya flies to Atlantic City to seduce Joe, and she reveals to him that she is married. Okay. So this is tricky. There's a lot of names being thrown around. <laughs> a lot of formal. Now that I know your process, I might have to change. I might need to edit. No, we do not stuff. edit. We do not edit. No. That, that's how the game. Whoa, motherfucker. But on the other hand, um, the description is specific, vague enough that this could fall into a horror movie. But the description is that of a lifetime movie, mostly. So be, just because it's like uh, it's interpersonal relationships and they fly on a plane and then get in. So lifetime movie is what I'm going to say. It's a lifetime movie. Wow, three out of three. You're doing great. Mm. 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 Number four. Hoping to walk away with a massive fortune, a trio of thieves break into the house of a blind man who isn't as helpless as he seems. Dude, I know this movie. This movie is, um, uh, don't make a sound or something like that. Like a 2015 or 16 film where a bunch of kids break into a deaf man's house and then he's, he is an adept deaf man. (laughs) And this is a horror movie. You're right. It's Don't Breathe. 2016. You got it right in the right in the nose. Don't breathe. Number five. You're killing it. Not a very good movie, in, in my opinion. Really? I've heard mixed bags reviews. If it's your that. thing, it could work, but not, not my deal. A lonely computer programmer exacts harsh revenge on three teenage girls after they play a cruel prank on them. On him. Lonely computer programmer. Gets revenge on three teenage girls after they play a cruel prank on them. See, I don't know. This is tough. I mean, it, it smacks of horror because because the protagonist is a male programmer and there ain't no females watching Lifetime who are like, I really identify with this. Yeah, so that's my, that's my thought. I'm going to go horror on this. It's a Lifetime movie. What the fuck? It's called The Bride He Bought Online from 2015. <laughs> Yep. That's absurd. Well, the, the bride he bought online? Uh-huh. How is that a lifetime movie? That sounds so demeaning oh, oh, to yeah, women yeah, yeah, yeah. to buy a bride. Right. <laughs> All right. Uh, number six. Okay. Michelle, a single mother, is kidnapped by three masked men and held hostage until she is forced to rob a bank, which is the only option she has to saving her only child's life while they are both wired to explode. Wait. So she's kidnapped 
Okay. And then she's forced to rob a bank to save her children that are wired to explode. Oh, man. Oh, man. This sounds kind of, this has like smacks of panic room about it. I mean, it's obviously not panic room. I'm just saying it, it's, it feels like that lane, which is kind of, which is a thriller. Mm -hmm. But there are plenty of thrillers on Lifetime. In fact, most movies on Lifetime are thrillers. So I'm going to hedge my bet and say Lifetime. Oh, baby. It's a Lifetime movie. Okay, I'm at five. I got five Called right. Held Hostage, 2009. Okay, Held Hostage. All I need is one more. All right, so are we going to do the rest if you get six? Sure. Okay. The audience may not have gotten six. Number seven. Not everyone is as smart as me. All right, we'll see if we can get this one. I'll throw you a curve, curveball. Grumpy Cat is a lonely cat living in a <laughs> mall pet shop. Because she never gets chosen by customers, she develops a sour outlook on life. Until one day during the holidays, a very special 12-year-old girl named Crystal enters the pet store. She falls in love with her after realizing she's the only person who can hear the unique cat talk. And the two develop a close relationship during the holiday rush. Then, one Christmas Eve, Grumpy must reluctantly thwart the kidnapping of an exotic dog she dislikes and rescue Crystal after the mall closes. Through her adventures, will Grumpy learn the true meaning of Christmas, or will it be, in her words, the worst Christmas ever? What the fuck is happening? What just happened? I feel like this took a huge left turn, and I've been... Does anybody know what's happening right now? How could this be... Is it a Lifetime movie or a horror movie? <laughs> okay, if it's a horror movie, it's in the same lane as Hocus Pocus, which, uh, if you listen to our Ready or Not episode, you know, has some pretty blue parts in it. Um, oh, man. But if it's a Lifetime movie, it's for little girls? Uh, I think it must be like a little kid's horror movie. So I'm going to go, horror? <laughs> Question mark? <laughs> Surprisingly, this is a what? Lifetime movie. What is happening? It's called Grumpy Cat's Worst Christmas Ever. What the fuck? I guess, okay, all right, well, whatever. The I, fuck psyched, is happening? I psyched you out. I am so, oh, man. so wigged out right wow. now. Wow. <laughs> that was so, how could anybody, how could anybody after hearing that not be like, what the fuck? Grumpy Cat? I know who that is, but what? So is it about Grumpy Cat? Grumpy Cat? Um, um, oh, man. The story of a woman who is slowly losing her sight whilst trying to investigate the mysterious death of her twin sister. So we have two women. Mm -hmm. uh, one dead, one not. One's losing their sight. The one is losing their sight. She's investigating. Mm, that's mysterious an important... Mysterious death. Mysterious death. I feel... I, it's just uh, losing her sight. I it seems like a lifetime movie because there's a lot of, yeah, I, yeah. I think I'm gonna go. I think I'm gonna lifetime on this. Horror! horror. <laughs> it's a horror movie. Whoa! Called Julia's Eyes from 2010. I'm 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 flubbing it. I've got five. I've, I just need one more to win. I know. I'm flubbing it. I got two more to win it. Okay. When the Davison family comes under attack during their wedding anniversary getaway, the gang of mysterious killers soon learns that one of their victims harbors a secret talent for fighting back. Oh, this is definitely a Lifetime movie. For sure. Right? Okay. All right. Right? I guess we'll just have to... Horror! No! Go on to the next question! <laughs> what is this? <laughs> this is your next 2011 you're next. Mm -hmm. I've seen this. This is, what? That's the description for your next. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. You changed it. I didn't. I copied and pasted that one. Read exactly. it again. When the Davison family comes comes under attack during their wedding anniversary getaway, the gang of mysterious killers soon learns that one of the victims harbors a secret talent for fighting back. Yeah, I guess it does kind of turn into Home Alone, like Home Invasion, Home Alone. All right, this is the last one. Oof. Ooh, alternate dimension sounds. A distanced couple decides to take in a seemingly innocent pregnant woman in hopes of adopting her unborn child. 
However, there is more to a book than its cover. Oh, no. <laughs> Am I going to lose this game? <laughs> you said I was for sure going to get this, and now I have no <laughs> idea what's happening. Can you read that one more time? A distanced couple decide to take in a seemingly innocent pregnant woman in hopes of adopting her unborn child. However, there is more to a book than its cover. I have no idea what this is, as far as what movie this is. This could so easily be both. Bryce is hiding his face to, as to not give away. Feel like it might be a big horror movie, but I don't know which one. So I am going to stick with that inclination and say horror. Oh, damn. What is it? <laughs> How could this, I have known that? This one is a deadly adoption. I thought you did this one just on your Lifetime or horror, horror movie we did today. A deadly adoption. I Let's see if I did. Hang on one moment. If you did, that, that would make this so hilarious. Well, oh, it's on my computer. I, I can't. Oh, my okay. computer's closed up. But um, I thought, if I I thought I, you just, <laughs> just did this one, but I might be wrong. There's probably all, a lot of adoption ones. Even if I did, yeah, I mean, you know, they're all such throwaway. Like, I mean, I can barely remember most things, right. let alone like fucking throwaway descriptions wow, of Lifetime I've, movies. I've redeemed myself. It's been so long since I beat you. Good job, man. Bravo. I hope people in our audience did better than me. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Five out of ten. <laughs> fucking grumpy cat wrong. <laughs> I really felt like it was a Hocus Pocus movie. Like, you know, I, uh, I feel see, like I, all of my losses were justified. I, I threw in grumpy cat and Carrie just to fuck with you. Well, they, they fucked and with I thought, me. And I thought it would be funny. Yeah. Well, that's my very favorite thing is throwing in a really like, you know, like describing very plainly the exorcist. <laughs> <laughs> or Gary. Uh -huh. it, it's, I enjoy that a lot. All right. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for sticking with us. We know there's not a lot of you here right now <laughs> looking at our stats. Uh, but thanks for listening. Again, uh, we love communicating with you on social media. So check us out on Facebook, Twitter. You know, we got an Instagram, TikTok. If you want TikTok. We do have a TikTok. Um, check us out on Reddit. In fact, um, head on over to our subreddit r slash horror movie talk and you know you, you can be part of the discussion over there yeah just subscribe it's probably the best place to have kind of a forum about all the posts we post everything every episode every blog we have over there so if you want to communicate with us there with the intention of starting a discussion with our community mm -hmm. check out our patreon yeah. become a patron and get access to exclusive content again we're trying to get up to 200 ratings on itunes so if you have Apple Podcasts, go and leave us a rating. That'd be great. Get all your friends to leave a rating. And if you want to subscribe, check out all the subscription links at HorrorMovieTalk.com. Just a hub for everything Horror Movie Talk. Thanks again. And remember, if you want to view this movie, head on over to Shudder. That's S-H-U-D-D-E-R dot com. Enter HMT at checkout. Get a 30-day free trial instead of that stupid seven-day free trial we hate. And then you can watch Henry Portrait of Serial Killer. I don't know for sure. You know, do your due diligence. Google this title first. Make sure it's on Shudder. Then sign up for it. But either way, sign up for Shudder because they got tons of high-quality horror titles. And you get a free trial in those 30 days. So check that out. All right. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Get your wheezes out.